Earth Day is claimed to be the largest secular holiday, celebrated by over a billion people worldwide. But isn't it really a religious holiday? Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. So since 1970, a group of people have been really trying to remake the world. And they've actually had quite a bit of success in doing it. They've changed energy so that we don't burn nearly as much fossil fuels. They've, they've reduced the birth rate worldwide so that nations are dying off. Uh, they've changed how we do garbage collection so you can't just put all, everything into one landfill. They've made major changes to how we've lived our lives. But is it really about helping the earth or is it, is it really just pushing a religion? I mean, you know, with any kind of an ideology like that, you're going to have the range of of attitudes for why people are involved in it. But I'd say a charitable understanding of it is is there's a lot of people who think that they are doing things that are helpful to the world, that they're trying to make the world a better place. But really, when you look at the things that are involved with the environmental movement, it functionally works like a religion. So if you're already uh, ready to write your angry comment about how can you say that anything to help the earth is a false religion, well, that's not really the, the point of this. You know, even as we're talking about, you know, is environmentalism a religion, doesn't mean that everything that environmentalism pushes for is wrong. Just like there's all kinds of false religions that say that you should do all kinds of good things, like not murder people. Uh, so that's not really the point of this episode. And the plan is that the next episode is going to be more about more practical things, but the, the point isn't to write off everything that environmentalism says, but to look at the worldview at a high level and say, is this, is this actually a religion? That's a good point, because you look at like Mormonism, right? I mean, the reason that Mormonism sells itself and a lot of people embrace it is they see they have a lot of problems in their family. And Mormonism teaches that you should have a family structure, that you should have a father and a mother, and that you should and raise your mother, children. And another mother. <laughs> 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 but they still like really push what they see as family values. And so, you know, every religion in order to be acceptable has to have some elements of truth in it or it just becomes this fantastical thing that everybody just ignores and just you don't get a following that way. So you actually have to be addressing some real problem in order to get a following to start at least. I was looking at you know what secular definitions if you will what what uh, government institutions, colleges define to be a religion. And I think I, I found a few and I came and I pulled one that had like eight, eight different categories that specified that it was a religion. And I thought it would be worthwhile tonight just kind of going through there and, you know, see how environmentalism fits into that. The first aspect of a religion is that it, it teaches a worldview. Does environmentalism teach a worldview? <laughs> Something called Earth Day should have a worldview. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it definitely does. I mean, and if you, I mean, if you look at, obviously, if you look at something like Christianity, the, the worldview of Christianity is that God is to be glorified above everything else, and Earth Day starts with that the Earth is this, that the Earth is supposed to be the central thing, that the Earth is more important than the people that live on the Earth, that the Earth is. The earth is the thing that you should protect and that needs to be taken care of and for its own sake and for the sake of the things that it provides. But in the end, I mean, there is this central worldview to the... And in a real sense, it's a rejection of taking care of it for the things that it will provide because if you're saying you should have fewer people that we need to reduce the population right. of the world, you're not saying it's because of what the earth will provide. It's how can you steal from what right. is effectively your God, right. and that when you take things from it, instead of saying that you're being a good steward of the earth, what you're saying is you're, you're pillaging the earth and you're, right. you know, you're raping her, basically. I mean, you can have, in just saying, is it a worldview or not, you can have inconsistent messaging. Mm-hmm. You could have somebody say, hey, look, there's reasons that you don't want to deforest the Amazon, and some of those reasons might be that... Well, if we do that, there's all the potential undiscovered pharmaceutical uses for these plants that are be going extinct. You know, or you could say that you don't want to do it because of ideological reasons that you're worshiping the plants. And those two are in conflict with each other, but in a sense, it doesn't matter if, if what you're really trying to push is, hey, leave the trees alone. Right. I do think, you know, from a Christian point of view, 
it does matter why you do things. Right, but, absolutely. And, and you know, we should think through what people's agenda is. But in the end, you know, there is a fundamental different agenda where if you're looking at it and saying that the world, you know, that we're basically supposed to be servants of the world, which is essentially what the environmental movement is, is that we're, the world's not here to serve us, we're here to serve the world. If you look too hard at environmentalism, it starts to have some, some big problems as a worldview. Like, you know, you know, are we part of nature? Why, why aren't humans part of nature? Why are humans bad, but nature's good, but we're also evolved from monkeys or monkey ancestors? Uh, but, you know, worldviews don't have to be consistent for them to shape people's view of the world. And, and it certainly does. You know, you hear, um, you know, a lot of uh, Democratic politicians every speech they give, you know, they have to throw in the environmentalism message. And, you know, that's probably not just appealing to their base um, as much as for at least some people, it's because it's really how they are viewing the world that, you know, a big part of what we, what our purpose is, is to protect the planet. Um, not, not in a Christian way, but in a way to say, well, we're past Christianity. What is our purpose? What are we doing here? Well, here's here's the answer, and so we have to, you know, whatever whatever topic we're on. If we're on inflation, well, the answer is go we'll fix global warming, and then we'll fix inflation. And that I mean, what you were saying there about the just the we're past Christianity. I mean, that's pretty interesting insight to to say we we don't have this thing that can give us sort of a transcendent moral structure in which to make decisions and exercise political power and things like that. So we look for something else, and environmentalism's pretty successful at giving us those kinds of things that you can appeal to for why do I want to behave such and such a way? Why do I want to buy certain products at the store? Why it's the government pushing certain policies as opposed to other policies? And it's really, you know, ultimately, environmentalism provides answers for those. Whether or not they're good answers, watch the next podcast. But it does provide answers and provides a framework in which to make those kinds of decisions. And some of those things, too, it, it also, you know, you talked about it being transcendent. The, the issue is also it, instead of people just being forced to think about their life and think about just the, what they see around them, all of a sudden you can change the planet. And so it gives this this expansion, this purpose to life that that isn't there since the you know, since our culture has become materialistic with materialism. There's nothing. Why does it matter? And then all of a sudden you have the environmental movement come along and, you know, they're, they're kind of coming along at the same time as you see the decline of Christianity, see the rise of the environmental movement. It says, no, there is a purpose. What you're doing is saving the planet. And it, it ends up you're saving the planet because you worship the planet. Right. I mean, it's, and be sure to remember, I mean, all religions that try to have a worldview in the end, they're really trying to replace the worldview that God provides. I mean, the problem with God is God comes with his own set of opinions. You know, I mean, God comes with his own definition of morality. God comes with his own rules. The world doesn't. I mean, the earth doesn't. The earth doesn't. The earth doesn't have any opinions. The earth doesn't care about anything. It's big, which is great because you want something big. You want something big enough right. for people to care about. You, nobody in their right mind hates the world. You know, I mean, there's this part where you look at the, you don't just look at the world, it's just, ugh, you know, what I mean, it's, it's beautiful, it's glorious, it's it's this it's this incredible thing that God has created. So, I mean, it checks all the boxes. If you're, you know, if you're a politician who wants to influence people, or you're somebody, you know, in the in the end, God's really difficult because you can't control God. But hey, the Earth, it just needs a spokesman, and so all of a sudden, it you know, it it, it falls into that place and fulfills all those little roles that you want. And for a politician to want to do it, right, he wants something that's really big because then you can justify spending more money on it. Right. And so what's bigger than the earth? So you can justify spending a trillion dollars on it or whatever we spent on it. You know, you look worldwide and it's amazing how much money has been spent on it. And a lot of it has no discernible benefits, right? We put in all these solar farms and all this other stuff that you can't see any real measurable benefit. It's all just people saying there's benefit. But, you know. It gives politicians a lot of power because then all of a sudden it's a big problem. And so you can see why they would want to push the religion because it is big. And there's no limit to how much you can spend on it because everything that we have, basically, you know, all the material things that we get, we get it from the earth. So, you know, that means you can consume everything in the world on trying to fix the world. And politicians love the power. And, you know, there's also a lot of uh, connections between environmentalism and other uh, 
well, more generally acknowledged religions, you know, a lot of, you know, there's, there's pantheism where God is in everything, everything has good and evil in it. Um, and that's, that has ties to environmentalism. A lot of the, a lot of the old pagan religions had, uh, you know, God as, um, you know, certain gods would be in certain things or rule over certain things. And you, so you definitely see some, some connections there where people in the past have worshiped, um, they, they acknowledge that they were worshiping elements of creation as gods. And so now people do it in a, with more of a secular veneer over it, but it's still kind of the same root thing. Yeah, you, your, your point there is that even though the environmental movement has a lot of connections to New Age philosophies, that you don't have to believe in crystal power to still get sucked into the religious power of environmentalism. And you look, and I mean, a lot of the, the you know, you look at the, you know, American Indians and their religion. I mean, it's they looked at the earth as the creator. I mean, these are just really common kind of views of the world. And so it ties into all those. And so it's it's nice and simple and comfortable. And, you know, where did I come from? Well, if there is no God, then who's left? And it's kind of the world. Right. A couple other things about the worldview that it creates is part of it's just because man is so small. I mean, man is so tiny, and like I so said, because the world is big, you know, when, when Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being, there's a part of it where, if, because man is so small, like you said, they thought of the world as the creator, there's this part of it where the world is big enough to go, that's what it means, is God is the earth, God is the world, and this works because man is so tiny, and, right. and he, but God is so much bigger than just the world. And the other part is because there was the fall. I mean, so many things, so much of the world is trying to explain explain the world in light of the fall. Sin came into the world, and everybody knows that sin came into the world. Sin is working in the world, and so everyone has to explain somehow what is sin and what is wrong with the world. And if what's wrong with the world is man, you know, man is the problem with the world. Not like man's, that the sin that man is under and the slavery that man is under to sin, but know that man, man's involvement in the world needs to be fixed, and that if we fix man's relationship with the world, not with God, if we fix man's relationship with the world, then everything will be well. And so it's again, it's 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 replacing God, replacing the world for God in in every single one of those pieces. And you know what the Bible calls when you replace something for God? I mean, this is anywhere you look in Scripture, this is idolatry. Right. And we think that we're we're really clever and that we're putting the entire world up. But you know, Scripture frequently says, "Don't make yourself an idol out of any created thing." Right. For example, take Leviticus twenty-six, uh, verse one. You shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. And, you know, think how we want to think of ourselves as advanced, that we're not like these ancient religions where they're bowing down before a big stone and all these other things. But the reality is all we did was transfer it to make it a bigger stone, one that we don't have the ability to to stand up ourselves because all these other people they would still do it but then we still get the same you know the same religious gatherings we still do things to to help the earth where we're kind of still doing the process of worship even though we didn't set up an idol the same way because we've just made the whole earth the idol and we haven't made the case for that yet i mean that's gonna we have to develop that through the rest of the podcast so stick with us i mean the other part is is, i mean but the the other way in which it's an idol is we actually don't worship the actual world, the people who do Earth Day. They don't worship the actual world. The actual world is much too big, is much too... They actually have to worship an idol of the world that they've made, this false image of the world. Because when they talk about, like, trash overrunning the nation or people overrunning the world, that doesn't work if you actually look at how big the world actually is and how many resources the world actually has. It only works if you worship an idol of the world that they carefully construct to show you that it's... The whole world is overrun with trash and we're overrun with people because it's not and it's nowhere close to it. And so in the end, at the same time where the idol is this huge thing, we still can't even comprehend because it's so big. We can't even comprehend it. So we have to worship it through these intermediary intermediary means that they've made and that they tell us and craft for us. And some of those things are just natural checks on it, right? I mean, there's a reason why I think that, you know, in cities and stuff— it's a lot more credible to say the whole world's overrun with people than it is if you're on a farm where the nearest neighbor's a mile away. I mean, and and you even see the pattern of acceptance of these things. And there is, 
I mean, it is based on, you know, population density and other things really, really does have real effect. And the people who are actually dealing closer to the environment, they tend to be a lot less associated with the environmental movement than the people who are distant from the environment, right? right? The people who are sitting in, you know, that they never leave where the streets are paved and where, you know, where it's all managed and everything. And it's not, you know, the population density is high. And they're the ones that are saying we need to solve the problem because the problem that they see is in their local environment. They don't realize how big the world actually is. Right. You go into the artificial created environment by man that's overcrowded because they built it the way they have and after their own mind and then they go, this is the problem with the whole world, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, it is, there's a lot of irony. And one thing I said before is that for religion to, to ring true, it has to have elements of truth in it. It can't just be falsehood. So, I mean, you know, the basic story of the world is there's a fall and then there's a redemption. And that's basically the story that environmentalism is trying to portray is that man came, he overran the world, he created all these problems, he created all this pollution, and now there needs to be a redemption of it. Man needs to, to repent of their sins. They need to stop polluting. They need to stop heating the world through burning fossil fuels. We need to do all these things, and then the world will be healed and we'll all be redeemed. And so, I mean, it does very much match the you know, I'm not saying that it's a Christian redemption story, but people think something needs to, you know, they see the fall and they need an explanation of the fall and they need to recognition that somehow it needs to be redeemed. And so most of the push for action is based on redemption, basically. And it's the idea of redeeming to that, to that worldview. I mean, just even the language of save the whales, save the earth. I mean, that kind of language is fundamentally religious language about redemption. Something is in peril. Something needs to be rescued. Here's steps towards that. Another aspect of of religion is that religions have to have a community, which, I mean, in Deuteronomy, God warns you to be really careful about how you create a, a community. If there rises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And so there is these part of what Satan does, which is part of also what God does, is he causes people to come and say, come join with me, come follow this God, come worship this. And so in any false religion, as, as well as with Christianity, there has to be a community that builds up and there has to be people whispering in your ear, come follow me. And since from the beginning, that's the environmental movement. I mean, they've been very active in doing that and very deliberate about doing that. Which makes sense considering uh, their worldview. If the problems that they're trying to solve are problems that are at a minimum, you know, national, but mostly global, you, you, one person is going to do nothing for that. So even, even if you take what they say, I mean, they say we need to have a community to do this because no one can do this by themselves. That's really core to their message. And a core to their message is also that the, the cumulative cause of these things is mankind. You know, we may point the finger at particular human beings, but really it's all of us collectively together that are causing the problems and therefore all of us have to band together to solve them and there's a there's just a practicality to it right i mean if if the world is your target then you can recruit everybody i mean you know if you have to move to utah to be part of the religion well that limits that limits who can be involved as people are willing to go to utah and people who want to you know i mean are people who are already in utah well if all you have to do is be on the earth to be involved in earth day guess what you don't have to do anything to be part of our movement. You're already in, whether you know it or not. And so in the end, it's, it's, their argument is, is you're already part of our community. And they're even co-opting natural communities that God has created. Because in the end, we, we're not, we are supposed to have some care for the earth. We are supposed to have some care for all the people of the earth. But there are these connections that they're sort of just going, right, these connections that already exist, they're part of our network as well. But where they really start with, and I think we'll show a clip here, of the reporting on the first Earth Day. But where they really started targeting was children. That's what they attack. And what they do is they do it through fear and inspiring fear. Because a lot of the parents would listen to it and go, man, are you exaggerating? We don't say that anymore. It's been you know 52 years of indoctrination since 1970. But there really was this whole, you know, 
you know, and Christianity also says, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so they really worked hard to build the community through fear, and they continue to work hard to build the community through fear. If you don't do something in the next 30 months, you're all going to die. So here's Walter Cronkite introducing Earth Day in 1970. This planet is threatened with destruction, and we who live in it with death. The heavens reek, the waters below a foul, children die in infancy, and we and the world, which is our home, live on the brink of nuclear annihilation. We are in a crisis of survival. This is a CBS News special, Earth Day, a question of survival, with CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. A unique day in American history is ending, a day set aside for a nationwide outpouring of mankind seeking its own survival. Earth Day, a day dedicated to enlisting all the citizens of a bountiful country in the common cause of saving life from the deadly byproducts of that bounty, the fouled skies, the filthy waters, the littered earth. As a demonstration, its success was mixed, beyond expectations here, far below there. No one now can know exactly how many took part. We do have an idea how many planned participation. Student groups in 2,000 colleges and 10,000 lower schools. Citizen groups in 2,000 communities. By one measurement, Earth Day failed. It did not unite. It did attract that broad cross-section of America its sponsors wanted. Not quite. Its demonstrators were predominantly young, predominantly white, predominantly anti-Nixon. Often its protests appeared frivolous, its protesters curiously carefree. Yet the gravity of the message of Earth Day still came through. Act or die. So act or die. <laughs> it, was, it was a sermon. <laughs> it was, you know, I, mean, I mean, it was really interesting. I mean, it reminded me a lot of some of the sermons that you would hear, not maybe as, as passionate as some of them, but I mean, but the words were... Words were pretty were pretty grim and austere. I mean, yeah, the, the horrible, the, the littered earth, the the ruined environment, and the message: act or die. The heavens above, the waters below. And I mean, part of it is that you know, if you go back to history, everything was. I mean, it was pretty bad in the early '60s, but everything was already starting to be cleaned up before all this stuff happens. Not everything. The the you know there was still smog, a lot of smog in Los Angeles. It was still on the increase, but a lot of these things it had already the peak had already passed when they come up with this stuff about we're all dying. And if somebody if they were speaking to people that were old enough to look back and go ten years ago was a lot worse. What are you talking about? We survived that. But again, they don't do that. They target ten thousand you know lower grade schools. They target two thousand universities. They target the people that. That number one, they can scare, and number two, that want to be divided from their parents, or or, so or they, effectively, I mean, kids who they don't have a choice to sell. If the teacher <laughs> says we're doing Earth Day today, you're doing Earth Day today. They act like ten thousand children all united to say we're no, doing ten thousand schools, ten thousand <laughs> schools. They act like they all did. I mean, no, the teachers told them that's what we're going to do. I mean, you know, it's like it was very much started with intentional indoctrination to go. You're not going to survive. This is about life or death. You're going to die unless we You're do something about the environment. Of your parents' decisions. I mean, every child wants some way to judge their parents. Every ch- you know, every child who gets corrected by their parents wants some way. And what they did is they handed these kids a way to go home, look at their parent, and go, "Look at what you've done to the earth. You're going to hand me this destroyed thing." And you know what I mean? We if probably you, won't even dis- survive until I get to be at your age. Right? But, yeah. How many little Greta Thunbergs did they make? Which is it's pretty, you know. It, I mean, I I did not re- I did not realize how grim it was. And you know, now it's it's even more grim. I mean, now, um, I mean, the latest move because there's been all these things saying, you know, in ten years or one year or two years, we're past the point of no return. Well, we're past those things. <laughs> and so there's a lot of people who really think we are past the point of no return, and they're sitting there saying, you know, I live my life. You know, I do this and that for the environment, but really, I live my life. I'm destroying the environment, and there's nothing I can do about it. And all the people around me are doing it. We're destroying everything, and it's hopeless. You know, right. we heard the warnings from the 70s, and we didn't do enough, and we're doomed. No, if they heard the wor- the warnings from the 70s, they wouldn't go, we're doomed. Because all the warnings from the 70s is we wouldn't make it until 1990. None of them were this far out. 
all the warnings from the 70s, if you listen to them, they're not saying we're going to die in 60 years. They're saying we're, I mean, like in the 70s when there was a big movement about elimination of the next generation so that we can make sure we feed ourselves. They were saying that we would all be starved to death by 1990. This is, it's 32 years too late. If you listen to those warnings and actually pay attention to them, you start to go, these people are fools. The problem is they don't. They just, the time passes and they just make it up again. And the time passes, so then they make a new date. And the time passes and they make a new date. And that's what they've done repeatedly. And so it always has to be closer than that so that the child can go home to the parent and go, I'm going to be dead before I'm your age because of what you did. And that's really a big element of it. I think it's more subtle and, and, and more pernicious than that because recognizing that we haven't all died yet, the messaging has changed where where now it's not – you're not so concerned about your death anymore because really the the environmental movement is, is doing everything it can to decentralize man. It's mm-hmm. more that your activities are destroying – earth or some elements of earth and it's because of what you're doing that the polar bears are losing habitats and that's the messaging that you're you're getting to hook children in and so now you know that child's going home and it's like well what you did is it's the butterfly effect and you're the butterfly right i mean yeah everything you do is a flap of the wings and because of that the polar bears are dying you know and part of it is i mean you know some of the environmental effects have been pretty positive. I mean, I remember in the the seventies we lived along a creek, and I mean, facilities just dumped their waste directly into the creek. I mean, there were algae blooms and everything else. I mean, it was it was a filthy creek because it was used to dispose of waste. And some of those things, they then pushed and said, "No, we shouldn't be dumping." Like, I mean, there would everything would like the the creek would foam and stuff because of how much soap was in there from laundry discharge and i mean it was you know and all that stuff did get cleaned up so as we talk about this we shouldn't go oh it's just horrible there have been some positive effects of it it's a lot better to have a creek that you can go into behind your house than one that you can't but instead of the point being that if somebody has an obligation not to harm his neighbor by pouring something into a river the answer was is because now they're saying is even though they stopped doing that well they had to pour that somewhere and they had to put it somewhere and it just by itself is killing the earth Right. Which is a fundamentally different proposition than the fact of if you put it in water and people are using the water downstream, that's going to cause some problems. Those are two very different arguments. And and so before, I think when you know when you hear, you know, the the warning, you know, do something or die, yeah, you know, there it was really visible things that they could see. But as some of those things were addressed, that were good to address in ways not not necessarily the way they were addressed, but they were, it was good to address them. You know, then they kind of have to shift to talking about things that you can't see. Because if you talk about things you can see and it's been fixed, then you kind of go, well, we're done with this. But if you go, but it's the polar bears that you'll never see. It's it's the size of the ice cap on on Antarctica and on and you know on the North Pole. It's the changes to weather patterns that are very hard to exactly to predict or say exactly whether it really is changes or is it right and then you kind of go oh we had another hurricane is it because of global warming or not right and you just everybody looks and that pays attention to the statistics and goes no actually the number of hurricanes is declining but they go every hurricane it's because of global warming and and you know so you make it big enough so that nobody can measure it and i think that's in the environmental movement that's definitely what's happened is we've made it big enough so that nobody can actually visibly observe it where you could observe before that pollution i mean i remember the first time i flew into los angeles it was pretty pretty disgusting you like can barely see the ground when you're up in a plane and you kind of like go through this cloud (laughs) that is very clearly visible out the window of the plane but those things it's you know we talk about pollution now and it's just not the same so at this point, we've we've wandered our way into the next uh, identifier of religions, which is that they have a central story, a central myth to them that that everyone can uh, can rally around and, and understand why they're doing what this religion is calling them to do. And one of the key elements of that that sociologists say is that it has to be irrelevant if it's true, for it to be a true religion. And we definitely see that with for it to be a religion, not a true religion, like a correct religion, but to be a religion. And we really see that with environmentalism because 
it's been disproven repeatedly. Right in the 1970s, they weren't talking about global warming. They were talking about we're all going to freeze to death. The no, the ice age is coming. There's no way to avoid it. There's not a chance that we can avoid it. Yeah, we're all going to die of skin cancer because of the ozone hole. But if we if we can survive that, then the ice age is going to wipe us out. Everybody's going to starve to death. And none of that happened. So then they switched to global warming. And regardless of the story, it keeps being proven to be false. But nobody cares because the myth is the important thing. The myth is that that man is destroying the earth, and that's the myth that if something's disproven of how that myth is going to be fulfilled, they just change the myth. But the root cause is man is going to destroy the world. Right, right. Everything about I mean, right. We were t- I was talking before about how the you know that you can't see, you know you sorry, let me step back. I was talking before about how that there were these arguments about population, about man is overcrowding the earth. There are more you know, more people than the earth can sustain. And I, I mean, there's more people now than there was obviously when I was younger. But when I was 18 years old, I think, the numbers were every single person in the entire world could fit inside the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida. You know, I mean, if, if they were all standing there. And I remember hearing that and going, that's very different than what I've been led to believe, you know, and so, I mean, and you just realize that the scale of the world is so much larger than you even have reason to even begin thinking about. When someone says that the earth can't sustain itself, you go, could we, could we plant more farms? Oh, no, no, we couldn't plant more farms. Well, why not? Well, let's not talk about what, well, I mean, okay, we could, <laughs> but, but we're not going to because then people would just have more children. And then you realize it's ideological. It's, it has nothing to do with practicality. It has nothing to do with the actual whether it could. It's that they don't want there to be more. They don't want there to be more people. Yeah, and that, that argument is also rapidly going away anyway because, you know, the population is peaking. But, you know, if things continue as they have been, it's going to start shrinking you know pretty much all the first world nations have including the united states have negative birth rates right where we're not replacing ourselves more people right. aren't being born than than are dying and there are nations that are starting to try to incentivize their people to have children because it's become such a problem that i mean japan what is it i mean 30 years and japan will be like half the size that it was i mean half the population i think that was five years ago i think they're right. further along the curve than that I mean, so, I mean, in, it's pretty striking when you th- i mean you think i about mean it, it got to the point where they banned immigrants because they said we will lose our culture because and then just a couple of years ago they opened it back up to immigrants because they said we need somebody to care for the elderly because there just aren't any youth at all i mean right. it's a nation that basically is disappearing as is ukraine as is russia as is italy as is greece i mean this isn't this isn't a narrow thing. You know, the population bomb, that whole theory was widely embraced. And, you know, we as a people, as mankind, has decided to kill ourselves off. It's pretty horrifying if you think about it. It's incredibly horrifying. We're all going to die. <laughs> well, no, the Act, world will go end. Go home. If the world must years. be peopled. The embracing of this religion is definitely focused in Western or Westernized nations because Japan's definitely a Westernized nation. Now China bought into it too and tried to kill off their people. But you look at other places, you look at Nigeria and the average birth rate is five and a half per for woman and replacement requires what, like 2.1 right. roughly. And so, I mean, their population skyrocketing. The population in Africa is skyrocketing pretty much across the board. And so the world is completely, they are going to successfully remake the world, it looks like, in the next 30 years. But it's not going to be depopulated. Because the reality is there are countries where the population is growing, and they're growing very quickly. So a lot of countries, including probably a lot of African governments, are working to stop that. They are. Because of Western funding being tied to pushing certain western ideologies about not having children so even as the mankind dies out on the earth we're telling people you can't have more children or we'll kill the earth it's a very interesting you know confusion but again these are myths that the environmental movement has been pushing and they don't care about the truth of the myth they mostly care that we have to maintain the myth we have to maintain that this is the position part of false religions that is a big differentiator between that and Christianity is all false religions are about darkness and Christianity is about light 
all dark, all false religions are about lies. Christianity is about truth. And so what no Christian should ever do is go, we're just going to, something's proven to be false, so I'm just going to embrace it anyway. But yet that's what is a sign of a false religion is that they don't care when things are proven false. You know, it says in Isaiah 50, 10, Who among you fears the Lord, who obeys the voice of his servant, who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. You know, the environmental movement is very much about walking in darkness. It's very much about not wanting to see what is what is plainly visible. The Mankind is not overrunning the world. It's not true. We have more excess food than we have ever had before. These things... There's so many of their their prophecies that have failed to come come to pass that people really need to say we're not going to embrace the darkness because instead they just go well this is what I was told so I'm going to continue to believe it. And there's a part of it where this happens because man left to himself does end in destruction. And so whenever you when you remove God from the equation, I mean God the, the light that came into the world as John talks about is the only reason there is hope. And if you purposely suppress that truth, if you purposefully suppress that hope, you are left with the, the, the cynical view of the world that it's going to grind into nothingness. I mean, God says the world is wearing out like a garment. So you can even look at creation and say, creation is wearing out. But God made it for a purpose. God made it to last for the length of time he needed it for. But if you take that out of the picture, you just look at it and you, you look at man and you go, we know what man is. Man ultimately fails. Man lets you down. Man is not man is not greater than himself. And so there is this part of it where the darkness is built in. The darkness is built into the view. There is there is nothing to rise up and grasp hold of because there's nothing man has no way to lift himself by his own bootstraps. What you're saying in a sense is that it's possible for man to look at the very real and very genuine effects of sin and see that there is a world that's cursed and see that mankind as part of that world is cursed and yet come to the wrong conclusions about the nature of all of that and how to fix all of that. Yes, absolutely. And they, they, they have no choice but to come to the wrong conclusion because if they ignore the truth of, God, of Jesus Christ. Right. right, and part of it is is that they also, I mean, they're hypocrites. They have to be, right? Because they go, man is so small is why this is happening. And they go, so man is so big, he can solve it. Right. Right. right? I mean, they have to hold these two things that are clearly contradictory at the same time right. to maintain the religion. I mean, the, the central contradictory thing is that it's really based on a, a, an evolutionary creation myth that mm -hmm. the world just came to be and that human beings are destroying it. But that based on evolutionary logic, that makes no sense because right. there are no morals, there are no values in evolutionary logic other than surviving to reproduce. Right. That's, that's it. And so the one that reproduces the most is the one that's winning. So instead of us winning, we intentionally kill ourselves so that we don't win. Right. Which is basically, you know, the, yeah, the, the philosophy of environmentalism is let's wipe out mankind and the philosophy of evolution is you should try to have as many people as you can and they, so many people that are zealous in the environmental movement, they hold both, even though they're blatantly contradictory. You know, but the idea that there are good things in the world that we need to be preserving and then there's wickedness that destroys it, I mean, that is borrowing from Christianity, that God created the world and right. that there's sin in the world. And so the, the only logic by which you can say that we need to conserve things is by adopting parts of a Christian worldview. So another aspect of religion that or pretty much of all religions is they all have rituals. And we're talking about Earth Day. <laughs> I mean, Earth Day is a really good example of a ritual. There are holidays, which holy days, right? I mean, that's where the word comes from. And so, you know, Earth Day is an example of, of one of the rituals created by the group. And like, as Walter Cronkite said, is an attempt to mobilize people across the nation. And it's become more successful over the years in the sense of, there was probably more participation, but there's more passive participation by far than there was right. the first year. He said there were a lot of people who mostly children did it. But the truth is, is if you look around at people's lives, there are people who they wake up every day. They use certain types of products that are made from recycled paper. They use, you know, they're careful in the fact that they don't use more paper product. Not, not 
not based on what they need, but based on some other sort of driver of, I have to be careful not to use more than I should. They use products that are from certain areas. They, they drive into a car that has fuel efficiencies that are based on certain standards that are built around the view of the earth. They go into work and they, you know, they don't print things off on their printer because of these things. They don't throw their cans away in certain trash cans. I mean, every single part of their life has been shaped by these policies and this view. And so, I mean, while Earth Day, everybody may not practice it as an active adherent of it and consciously do it, you, you're, you're probably a participant in some form of, of Earth Day celebration. With or of the environmental movement, right? right? Maybe not Earth Day, but in the environmental movement and right. just the idea that, that it has affected so many aspects of our lives. Right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And you look at Earth Day, right? I mean... You know, people go out on Earth Day and they, you know, go collect garbage on the side of the road or they go to a protest. Or, I mean, these are the kind of things when they say a billion people participate in it. These are the kind of things that they mean by that is that they do some kind of action. And, you know, do you feel good if you went up and picked up garbage on the side of the road? Sure. And that's not a bad thing to do. But it's when you start to do it to say that we've had a collective good because of that, that, you know, a sixth of the population, seventh of the population, the world has participated in it. Look at how we can change things. And guess what? It doesn't change much. The ritual is just that a ritual. I mean, I think core to the idea of a ritual is that it's not an action that in and of itself is doing something as much as it sim is what it symbolizes, you know? So, if you're, you know, recycling and your recycling is sent to the landfill with everything else, well, that that's a ritual. <laughs> if you're, if you're, you know, selling scrap metal to recycle, that's not a ritual because there's there's a there's a different reason for it other than just, you know, to to keep up with your religion. But rituals do have at least the function of maintaining community that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier. That you really don't have community unless you've got rituals that define the edges of that community. And Even if your community is defined by hating the people who remind you to do some of the things. <laughs> sure, absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, the, the things like, you know, if you sit down and you watch a nature documentary, you realize that the structure of a nature documentary is basically along the lines of any Baptist sermon, where you're going to start out with, uh, you know, let's lay out the text. I'm going to tell you what we're going to show you. <laughs> right now there's going to be a little hint of something's wrong and then you're going to get all of this amazing footage of things that you could that doesn't never sound like see. baptist sermons to me <laughs> but i mean but it's it's laying out here's you know here's sh walking you through the text and then them bringing you to the end where you get these applications you get these dire warnings about here's what's going to happen if you don't act in certain ways and right Hellfire right. and brimstone, maybe maybe not quite brimstone level, but at least a few degrees. Not for warmer. you, for the elephants. <laughs> Hell is just an oil fire on the ocean. I mean, that's, that's... right, right. And you, you know, it's it's just this short of an altar call, and the only reason there's not an altar call is because you're watching it at home on your couch. And they take credit cards. <laughs> and I do, in a sense, they do. I mean, I recognize that they aren't calling you to come forward, but they're definitely calling you to do an action. And, you know, they're calling you and saying, you need to do something, you need to do something now. I mean, that's very much, that's part of the ritual, part of the, the process that people use to keep, you know, perpetuating the religion. Right. And there's also a sense of, like I said, there's always on those, in the nature shows, a sense of a call to a community and a connection to the things that you're seeing, right? I mean, you do this because we are all part of this planet or you know and it'll be you know some swelling music and then pictures of animals and things and animals mothers treating their young well and you know and so there's this picture of the harmony that can be created the utopia that we could actually hopefully enter into if we all embrace this dream and there's no people there the elephants would stomp, stomp them to <laughs> death so they don't, they don't put them there <laughs> Yes. Don't read Peter Hathaway Capstick if you want to keep your your, your your vision of animal utopias intact. And it really is that, you know, in those things, again, the ritual is, you know, the, the Christian ritual, if you will, which is the Lord's Supper, is supposed to 
remind us that there's a resurrection to come. Jesus Christ died and was buried, and he rose again, and, and this is, means that we will rise again, and so we proclaim his death until he comes. And that's kind of where these things end up going, right, as they end up going to, there can be this utopia. We can reach this point where all these things are wonderful and beautiful, and, and you know, that's what they're going for. It's that same kind of idea is that there is a point where everything will be restored and everything will be wonderful. So another aspect of religions is, you know, part of being a god is that you define good and evil. Part of being a god is that you give law. And so every religion has laws. And I think it's really easy to see in the environmental movement. You know, there's a big push not to just have laws that are philosophical laws, but have laws that they try to get you to enforce, right? I think in Durham, if you throw two tin can or two aluminum cans in a trash bag together, you know, there's a fine for that that you're supposed to receive. And, I mean, these are them codifying the ethics, codifying the laws of the religion. And the, and the ethical system can be fairly complex. I mean, if you look at Christianity, one of the commandments is thou shalt not kill. And at the same time, the death penalty is allowed, and war is allowed under certain circumstances. So thou shalt not kill, and yet at the same time, there are required killings. And the, the, the uh, Earth Day and the environmental movement is no different. Because there's a part of it where we should look with horror at someone cutting down a tree or someone killing an animal, but we should not look with horror on someone limiting the population of humans by abortion. And so these, you know, I mean, these things, you know, you, you chop down a tree and you've murdered a tree and you kill a baby in the womb. And well, that's just part of the way that we regulate and maintain the environment. And so, you know, and I'm not saying that Christianity is wrong by having that, that juxtaposition of views, but I'm saying Every one of them, their ethical system allows for a complex and what someone externally might look at and go, this is contradictory, but they'll explain, no, 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 this is why this isn't contradictory within our view. This is, you know, and so within Earth Day, they have explanations for why this is okay, why abortion is allowable, but, but why we shouldn't do these with other things. And ultimately, theirs doesn't work and it doesn't make sense, but we have to understand this. I mean, it's amazing that people, what they can hold in their head that contradicts what they said previously. A lot of their reasons are incredibly simplistic. You know, they go, an electric vehicle is wonderful and a gas-guzzling vehicle right. is just evil. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. Like, a lot more complicated than that. What about all the power plants that you have to build, the point pollution because of all the power plants to expand so that you can replace everything with electric vehicles? The reason that you don't see any of these problems is they're just such a small percentage and they can't affect anything. But as soon as you do, how much mining do you have to do to get all these rare earth materials? So That are so, much rarer than the fossil fuels. Than the fossil fuel. The and they're saying, oh, you can't. You, yeah, you can't plunder the earth by doing the fossil fuels, but we can plunder the earth by, by doing these rare metals. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much picking and choosing to say this is ethical and this isn't. And they can make arguments, but they're really very arbitrary in their arguments because they only look at what they want to look at. And, and I mean, and that was kind of and what that was one of my points is that Christianity actually does have explanations that make sense and that holds together. Or and consistent that, with one right, another, not hypocritical. That you can push on and you can deal with. And I mean, and in the end, you can even look at it and say the reason why environmentalists say that it's okay to kill a child is because in the end their rebellion is, is God says man is made in the image of God, and they want to deny that man is made in the image of God. So they want to, they, there is a desire to destroy the image of God, and there's a desire to worship the creature. And so you can even see that the rules that they're making up are really just defined by their rebellion against God at the same time as that they protest and make these arguments and make these, you know, these complex statements that, like you said, really in the end aren't that complex. And part of all ethical systems is that there's times when you should do sacrifices, right? And so, you know, there's, and you do sacrifices not because they produce an end, which is like we talked about recycling before. Most of the recycling that happens, it goes right into the same landfill right next. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's separated in what part of the landfill, but it's going to the same landfill as everything that wasn't recycled. There's very little that, that for, you know, is, is cost effective to recycle. Aluminum cans, yeah, great to recycle. Beyond that, you know, some paper, if you keep it clean enough, you know. Cardboard, if you're taking it from a grocery store who knows how to do it, if you're mixing pizza boxes in it, it's not worth it. You're creating more carbon than you are by, you know, recycling cardboard. You know, there's really basic things, but yet people do it and they go, you know, I'm being ethical, I'm being careful when 
nobody's telling them even the basic things that would make it worthwhile. And they just, oh, we need to recycle. And, I mean, this is not a minor thing that the vast majority of American recyclables used to be shipped to Southeast Asia, where they would then be processed into consumer goods and sold back to Western nations. And then Southeast Asia just stopped buying them because they said, oh, we have enough of our own trash. We don't need your trash anymore. And this, I mean, this happened a couple of years ago, and that's why at least you know, here in North Carolina in our office building, for example, they don't have recycle bins anymore because it all goes into the landfill because nobody can figure out a cost-effective way of handling those kinds of goods. Sorting the trash and handling it in two different ways was just added cost. Because they, because you have no no one who wants to, to purchase it right. from you. And the, and the big reason that nobody wanted to purchase it is that the average Chinese started to make more. So if you can pay somebody two cents an hour, you can have them sort out paper that has very little return on it because so what? You're only paying them a couple cents an hour or whatever. So one of the things that they're saying is we should have fewer people, but to recycle requires more people. And so it's cost effectiveness shifted because of the, the wealth of the people that were doing it. And so all of a sudden, this thing that was supposed to be so helpful, well, it wasn't really helpful at all. All it was doing was burning man hours that really probably could have been used better for other things. So, you know, again, when you talk about the list of features of a religion— one of the standard features that sociologists would say for something to be a religion is that you have to have types of religious experience. You have to have emotional experiences um, as part of that religion. And I mean, we've already touched on many of these throughout this podcast. You know, you, you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. You know, it's it's either this or death. Um, David Attenborough is going to hug you. <laughs> right. Or, yeah, you're, you're going to get these nature documentaries where at the end of them, the soaring music is really pushing you towards having a particular kind of emotional response and feeling senses of guilt and or maybe hope or, you know, but it's really trying to make you feel a particular sort of way. And I mean, and genuinely, if you've never watched some sort of nature documentary and at the end of it felt a sort of sad sort of wisdom, because of the combination of the things you've heard and the music and the sw and everything that's been paced, you know, is as it's if if they've done their job well, it's very easy for you to sit there and feel like you've come to some fundamental understanding of the world and a connection to it. And 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 if you step back and later and look at it, and you went, oh wait a minute, I was just being manipulated. But in the end, it's very effective at the time. It's it's as effect. I mean, like you talked about, like an alt. They don't do an altar call, but it's pretty close to an altar call. And that's really important to you know, be honest about. So my brother-in-law went on a field trip with his, when his children were in public school, and they went to a forest. And the teacher turns to him in the forest and goes, don't trees cry when they get cut down? Don't you hear them crying? Because she knew he was a forester. And so she's convincing all those children that trees cry when they get cut down. You get somebody like Greta Thunberg out there like pushing these things. All she has been done is manipulated with emotion. And we should think that or we should recognize that even as though she went that far, that this is what they're trying to do with all the children in public school pretty much is they're trying to catch them and bring them into this movement. And so later when you see them graduate from high school and you see them graduate from college and they're, you know, saying, I would never invest in a company that, that does this and I would never work for a company that does this. They were hooked with emotion when they were young and they kept being fed that this is really serious. And even as they grow up, they don't forget that emotional connections because emotional connections are one way to really reinforce things and cause people to remember things. You know, environmentalism is very connected with science or supposed to be very connected with science. But the thing is, you know, having emotional appeals isn't really the best way to do science. I mean, it's good to have passion for the science you're doing, but to have it all be driven off of which scientist can make you feel the saddest or the happiest, and that's the person, you know, that's the person who's right, that's the person we need to give resources to to fix the problems of the world. Well, that's how a lot of stuff has been driven, but, you know, the stuff that makes the most emotional appeal isn't always going to have the most impact on the world. I mean, not only is emotional appeals not the best science, it may not be science at all. <laughs> <laughs> it typically is not considered. To, you know, another thing that, that characterizes religion and that there's material expression, right? I mean, that you, you do things so that people recognize that you're part of the community. 
and that they you recognize it. What you talk about is material expressions. I mean, you, you know, we've heard the term a lot lately, the last couple of years of, of virtue signaling. Right. I mean, that's that there's so much virtue signaling where you are making expressions of your adherence to the faith. Right. And this is things like buying that Prius so that you can look good while you're parked in the Whole Foods parking lot and you know, and, and I'm not saying there's anything morally bad about a Prius or Whole Foods, but if you are doing it as an expression of your worldview, your your environmental worldview, then that's a problem. You're, you are doing those things as acts of religious worship. Right. Certain things have, like, you know, swept over, and part of it is because capitalism connects to it, but just this idea that our drink, wa- drinking water is unsafe. We have the best drinking water in the world by far. Most drinking water, most mm. bottled water that you buy is just another city's drinking water. But why do all these people use bottled water? Now, sometimes it's convenient, and if sure. it's convenient, sure, get a bottle of water. That's fine. But one of the reasons that the bottled water has swept over America is it's virtue signaling. I care about the cleanliness of my water. I care, you know, we're, our water here is filthy because it's just not true. Right. I mean, it is, right, my water costs $8. My water costs $15. My water costs $30. It sounds fantastic. Right. <laughs> As opposed to my water costs a dollar for 5,000 gallons or whatever it costs if you're getting it from the from the local water supply. And, and but so much of these things that we've embraced as a culture and that a lot of people are doing that would say, oh, I'm not an environmentalist. Yes, I want to help the environment, but I'm not trying to worship the environment. We just have to recognize how many of these things are are widespread and accepted. And this is just, you know, people aren't willing to risk the anger of the community by going against it. So they just go along. And a lot of that really points to the last feature that we'd want to discuss as a feature of religion. And really, it's a it's the sacredness of things. And, and virtue signaling like that only works if you're able to have defined structures of holiness. And, I mean, we've kind of touched on that earlier with talking just about the sort of community and the rituals. But really, these are the things that are setting you apart, making you different, making, making you holy according to the standards of the thing. And does environmentalism have standards of holiness? Do they have sacred things absolutely and i mean one of the you know very related to that is one of the typical sacred things is a priesthood and in environmentalist environmentalism the the priesthood connects to politicians right because that that way you don't actually have to do anything because it's the politician that needs to to intercede with the planet. The politician's the one that needs to do something that will fix everything. And so you can both be a faithful adherent and never really make any sacrifices because the politician is working to do it and he'll get it there when it gets there. Or they collect the sacrifices through taxes. Right. You know what I mean? So, it's, so it's, that so it's you, a common sacrifice right. that everybody has to make and I have make no special sacrifice. Right. There's a reason why former Vice President Al Gore became, you know, the, one of the leaders of the environmental movement. He was one of the high priests of it before, and so he just kind of shifts into that role. And then he tried to be a prophet, which is another sign, right? I mean, the sign of a religion is that it has prophets. And you look at the environmental movement, and the environmental movement constantly has prophets. And prophets do two things. One, they, they, they tell the future— and the other thing is they speak the truth about their religion. They are the ones who are in charge of, of preaching the truth so that you understand. I mean, they make correct, they make course corrections. They make, you know, they make doctrinal statements about, about what the faith should actually be holding to. And so they, they shape the faith as it moves forward. They declare law and judgments for breaking law. Right. And, you know, one thing that you see in a lot of religions is that the – uh, the people at the top don't live by the things that they're saying. And that's something that you definitely see true with environmentalists, where everybody flies in their private jet to their summit on environmentalism and how they need to save the planet. Well, what if you didn't all fly in your private jets? You know, that is pretty, right. you know, don't don't fly in private jets when <laughs> you could all go in one jet. Right. You know, that's pretty basic, but, you know, that's that's not how they live their lives. Right. I mean, that would involve doing some virtue signaling, which isn't always convenient. Well, every religion has an aspect of there's sin in the world and people will abuse it. Christianity actually was designed so that the people who are priests and who are prophets actually they don't have they don't have immunity 
from the sins that they're, you know, they don't, they don't get to do sins that other people aren't supposed to do. They don't get access to things that put them in a totally different category in the sense of justice or in the sense of righteousness. I mean, it's actually the opposite, right? To whom much is given, much is expected. God says the opposite. Now, so often in Christian churches, people hold their leaders to a lower standard. That's against the law of God, right? The law of God is too much is given, much is expected. If the person goes up front and he's caught in sin, you rebuke him in the presence of all. It's not let's cover it up because they're leaders. It's let's expose it because they're leaders, which is very contrary to, to religions that are based on the worship of the creature, which is what environmentalism is. So I think going over all these points, it's pretty clear that environmentalism ticks a lot of the boxes, if not all the boxes, for what makes a religion. Doesn't mean it's a good religion, but it is. Uh, it does. It does. It is a religion. Um, and so I think it's important, though, not to just reject everything that anyone who's an environmentalist says, but to look at it critically. And and we'll try to try to do that in a future podcast to say, well, what are what things that are out there that people are saying are reasonable, are in accordance with the script, the standards the scripture gives, and what are uh, products of a false religion. Christians should recognize how much they're affected by the community and the culture around them. And over the last 50 years, the, you know, the American culture, even further or much broader than the American culture, has embraced environmentalism as a religion. And every Christian should examine and see where he has been impacted by that, where he has followed along with that, just because that's where our society is, and we are affected by the people around us. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so Christians have to fight against it. And part of fighting against it is, first and foremost, to recognize that there is a religious basis to their view. And it's being pushed in our culture, and Christians have a responsibility to push back. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.